Greetings to you. My name is Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 84, Compartmentalisation. This is the second vlog in a two-part series I constructed for Michelle. Michelle asked me if I'd give her some strategies to think about and enable a PhD when life becomes just a little bit too big. Life and family and work and teaching become a bit overwhelming. So last week's vlog we talked about creating that mindset using Bill Shankly, but this week we're deploying a quick and dirty tip, if you will, compartmentalization. I'm going to put in place some quick strategies that can transform your productivity and efficiency today. It is also a great technique when some pretty terrible things happen to you. So death, divorce, disability, the three Ds, when these terrible, difficult situations happen to you, we can give up on the PhD, and that's a legitimate decision, or we can think about strategies and modes and ways to actually enable that completion, even when life becomes pretty arduous. So in this vlog, we're going to talk about the etymology of compartmentalization, where it comes. It comes from psychology as a discipline and has moved into management theory. So we're going to talk about that. But the first time I actually heard the word compartmentalization was in relation to Bill Clinton. Yes, the former president of the United States. And I heard about it in relation to the Monica Lewinsky scandal, and particularly his impeachment situation. And how did he survive it? Well, at the time, people stated, well, the way Bill Clinton got through Monica Lewinsky while being president of the United States was via compartmentalization. So, yes, he was president of the United States, and he was managing attacks on his private life from every quarter of his existence, his political enemies, his political friends, and he also had to manage on a daily basis the shame that he brought to himself, to his political party, but also to his wife and to his daughter. But somehow, through all this shame and blame and guilt, he kept governing. So he fulfilled his job as president while also managing in a different way the Lewinsky scandal and the impeachment. So that demonstrated, I think, remarkable fortitude and commitment, whatever you may think of his behaviour. So there's an example of compartmentalisation, someone being president of the United States while all this personal stuff is happening. But how does this sort of strategy operate? in a PhD. We've got the example, let's get to the definition. So compartmentalization is the separation of emotions and emotional states that conflict with one another. The cliches of compartmentalization include honor among thieves and an angel at school and a devil at home. So compartmentalization is configured as a negative characteristic leading to health problems in particular because we repress negative emotions. So it seemed to be if we're not actually processing the emotional states and the bad things that happen to us, that can lead to health concerns and certainly I would recognize that. But from psychology, compartmentalization is a coping mechanism it is a defense mechanism to stop and block cognitive dissonance. So it's used particularly by people who are managing childhood and indeed adult trauma. Its meaning though has now changed. It's now describing, as it's moved into management theory, a conscious series of strategies and decisions to manage conflictual responsibilities and yet remain productive. So it is therefore quite a useful tool to think about while you're in the middle of a PhD. When a stressful experience is avoidable, I think there is a benefit at times to at times step away from that stressful experience. Just stop it for a moment and do something else for a while. Because if nothing else, that switching off from the problem gives you a break from the trauma, gives you a break from what's going on in your life. Yes, it's also a way to manage emotion, and yes, it's also a way to increase your productivity. 
So this new inflection, this new theorization of compartmentalization also does link with mindfulness and the mindfulness movement. Now, a lot of my great friends around the world actually do theorization and do research on mindfulness. And I've read the research and it is you know, a great series of techniques and strategies. It's a little bit hippie for me, but just know that compartmentalization, when we take it a few stages on, does actually lead to mindfulness. And there's good research about what the mindfulness movement does in terms of managing stress. But as it's, at its most basic, compartmentalization allows us to switch off when we get home. So you know there's people that go, right, I've had a hard day, and then they come home and they're able to switch off from work. At its most basic, that is compartmentalization. So that stuff about that cliche, which I actually disagree with, the work and life balance. But the problem with these types of strategies in the contemporary workplace, let alone if you're doing a PhD, is that work occupies, work colonises every little part of our lives these days. That's the nature of work. So this is, I think, when compartmentalisation becomes incredibly useful because it allows us to make conscious decisions, conscious decisions that this is about work time and then you know what, with consciousness, I'm moving to something else. You're not allowing work or a PhD or indeed your family life to bleed throughout the entirety of your day and existence. Because we all know a PhD is stressful, families are stressful, teaching is stressful, work is stressful, making a living is stressful. Now, some stress is useful. There are some people that argue, oh, look, I love deadlines, I love stress. I'm not one of those people. I very much like to manage stress. And I think we also need to remember that in the word distress, stress is within it. So the movement from stress to distress, I think, can be quite rapid. And when all these stresses mash up into our lives, it's no wonder all of us start to do slightly strange things, like banging our head on a desk, or screaming uncontrollably, swearing uncontrollably, listening to ACDC's TNT on repeat. That's something I do a great deal. And also, of course, watching Game of Thrones and wondering when precisely our life started to look like the Red Wedding. So what I need you to do, at its most basic, if you just want to try a couple of compartmentalization strategies, the first one is the easiest. I need you to try some digital dieting for me. So what that means is stop connecting to your emails, to Facebook, to Twitter, to LinkedIn, to Instagram. Stop connecting with those applications 24 seven. Compartmentalize, hey, this is when I am doing email, this is when I am on Facebook. Separate your life out. Do not allow digital bleeding into your analog life. So that's the first step in compartmentalization, stopping analog issues being disrupted by digital means. So compartmentalize your functions. The second easiest way to enact compartmentalization is to link particular functions to particular times. So have a scheduled work day. So this is when I exercise, this is when I do emails, this is when I'm at work or do my PhD, this is when I do my teaching, this is when I edit, this is when I do my experiments, and this is when I stop doing my PhD and go on to do something else. This is also described as serial monotasking. Serial monotasking. A wonderful professor in medicine asked me last week, she's a wonderful person, oh Tara, you're so incredibly productive. Well, that was a lovely thing to say, and she's a wonderful woman. But the reason I think I am very productive and very efficient is because I serial monotask. So I do not allow bleeding. I work on a task with intensity and then I move to the next one. So this is a very regimented strategy, but it really does squeeze out as much of your day and the productivity of your day as we can put in place. It's also a way to process information. It's also a way to make quality and significant decisions during your day. It is a great way to reduce stress. It is a great way to stop yourself being overwhelmed. So I am doing this task at this particular point of the day and no other task, really important. 
The other uh, really a great advantage, I think, of this type of compartmentalisation that did change my life is that we start to respond to change rather than react to change. The last 10 years I've had some very stressful managerial jobs in some pretty difficult places and a lot happens and a lot of people sort of just place their stuff onto you, they overshare their problems onto you. Now if I was in a really stressful, edgy environment then I would simply be reacting with anger or fear or all the rest of it and I don't do that. I respond to issues, I don't react to issues because my stress is under control and my work day is under control. So when bad things happen, I'm emotionally and intellectually centred enough to make a good decision. So compartmentalisation is also great when you're dealing with a major life tragedy. So you get sick, your partner gets sick, your kids get sick, a life tragedy happens to you, your partner or you may lose a job. And when that happens in the middle of a PhD, it is beyond belief, it is catastrophic. Now this is where compartmentalisation gets interesting and also significant, I think. So what you start to do is separate out your emotional life and your intellectual life so that you're not overwhelmed by emotion, you're not overwhelmed by the tragedy. Therefore, you work on your PhD, you compartmentalise, you do the work on that PhD for two hours, for four hours or for eight hours. You don't focus on anything else, you separate the emotional stuff away, you do that focus and then you stop and you reconnect your emotional life and activate decisions in that sphere. Now emotions are very, very messy. They can spill over into the rest of your life and you do make bad decisions. And they do break through in all the spheres of your life. But if you are enrolled in a PhD, you need to show focus. And if a tragedy is bleeding through all elements of your life, including your PhD, it is really a legitimate decision to say, you know what, I am going to stop this PhD. Okay, that's a legitimate, compartmentalised decision. But if you make a decision to continue the PhD through the tragedy or the difficult moment in your life, then compartmentalisation is the best way to manage it because you are consciously creating compartments and structure in your life and you are managing your emotions and then reconnecting those emotions at the conclusion of your day. This is mentally tough to do, there is no doubt about that, but it also does build mental toughness and uh, we all need that at the moment in universities and beyond. I remember a great article that Ryan Blair wrote in the great magazine Forbes and he explained how he was managing in his life at one particular point a huge business deal as an entrepreneur. He was also managing how to help his son manage autism moving through the school sector and also trying to fulfil his mother's wish to be removed off life support. So there it is, a nightmarish work situation, an issue with his son and an issue with his mother all at the same time. So what Blair did I think is a model for all of us. He firstly realised, this is really important, that he had finite emotional and physical energy. So he was not going to be able to spread himself too thin, his resources were finite. So what he did is he prioritised, he stated those three variables are the most important thing in my life, everything else for the next few months is going to be way down the list. So he said no a lot, when new opportunities and options came up, he said no. And he separated out those three clear goals in his professional and personal life and did not allow them to bleed across the compartments. So compartmentalisation through this type of strategy goes through the following steps. You isolate strongly all issues from one another. You apply full consciousness and focus on separating out those issues. Do not allow them to bleed. And then you work on one issue. You open that compartment up. You instigate incremental change in that compartment you then close it up and move to your next compartment. Very powerful. So you say no to anything, anything new, that does not deserve a compartment. 
So, this is a short to medium term strategy that can be incredibly useful while you are in the middle of your PhD. It's not a long term strategy because it's hard to keep the compartments together, it's hard to say no all the time, but when you're in the middle of a really difficult situation, this strategy will get you through it. It's not about a work and life balance, it's about survival. When life and family and the PhD simply become too much and you need a way through it. And the three Ds are often the great trigger, I think, to start compartmentalisation. Death, divorce, disability. The three Ds, this strategy will get you through the short to medium term ways to address them. So this is a conscious strategy. It requires visualisation from you. You have to open a com compartment, focus on that compartment, close that compartment. It's visualisation. So attendant to compartmentalisation in this form is emotional detachment. You've got to be a bit emotionally detached here to make it work. And Michael Schreiner did some fantastic research in this area about emotional detachment and compartmentalisation. And he argues when we are managing emotional abuse, abandonment, trauma from primary caregivers or trauma from being a primary caregiver, compartmentalisation is a logical and rational response to a really difficult moment in our lives. So if you or your partner or your kids are managing the three Ds and you're enrolled in a PhD, <laughs> you really only have three options. One, you can pretend that nothing's changed, continue on as normal, and then all the emotional traumas and the emotional responsibilities soak through the entirety of your life. So your PhD suffers, your family suffers, everything suffers, so that strategy just simply doesn't work. Two, stop your PhD and focus on yourself or your partner or your family. That is a legitimate decision. It does work, but you also need to know that the students who leave a PhD program, <coughs> inverted commas, temporarily, often leave it permanently. So when you make a decision to leave a PhD program, often you don't come back, and that's fine if bad stuff's happened to you. The third strategy, which does work, is compartmentalization. So work on your PhD, park your emotions when you do so, and then close that PhD compartment and move on with the rest of your life. So this is not changing who you are. This is just simply organizing yourself, rendering yourself functional and productive when really bad stuff happens. So just like breakthrough pain, there will be breakthrough emotions through your compartments. You are a human being, don't judge yourself. Just take a breath and move to the next compartment. But you'll find that most of the time, this separation of your public and your private life, your professional life and your family life, is incredibly useful. I'll give you one example of a case that I had to enact in the last year using this. As many of you remember, my wonderful PhD student, Mick Winter, died earlier this year, and he just finished his full first draft before his death. So Steve and I asked my great boss, the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, Rob Saint, hi Rob, you rock, uh, we asked Rob if he would allow us to conduct editing from that first draft to enable Mick's completion of his PhD, and Rob said yes, and that's great. But I couldn't let myself feel the personal loss of Mick's death. He'd been my friend for 10 years. I'd had daily engagement with him during those 10 years and a weekly meeting with him during those 10 years. He was a great scholar, always gave me the intellectual highlight of my week, one of the smartest people I've ever met on the planet ever. And so it was a great experience every day to work with him. But I couldn't let myself feel that personal loss. I had a responsibility to get that thesis through to examination with integrity, and with respect. So I compartmentalised. I did not let myself mourn that friendship. I did not let myself mourn that great man. So at the conclusion of my working day, I closed that compartment and I used to come home and give Mick one hour every day working on his thesis. So I immersed myself in his sentences, in his paragraphs, in his pages, in his chapters, so that I could get that thesis through to completion. I 
I didn't feel the loss of that friendship. I didn't mourn him. I haven't mourned him. I had a responsibility to get that thesis through. So that was compartmentalisation. And the thesis is currently under examination, so let's hope we get a, a good resolution for Mick. But that was an example of compartmentalisation. Now, if that thesis passes, uh, I will give myself permission to open up the compartment and deal with Mick's death, actually deal with the emotions involved in that death. And my office knows the moment I do that, probably leave me alone for a couple of hours at my office, because it's going to take me some time to process that. But if I had dealt with that emotion, I wouldn't have been able to get that PhD through for Mick. And you know what? He deserved that. And the best way to honour that great man was for me to compartmentalise, get rid of the mourning, put that off for a few months. It's now eight months, so it's taken a while, but try and get the thesis through. So Michelle, I hope compartmentalisation may be a strategy that's useful to you. Construct compartments, visualise those compartments, attach a function to a time and a location during the day, if you can, and align all the functions of your life like a timetable. That's productive, that's efficient. Open the compartment, work hard in the compartment, close the compartment, move to the next one. Thank you, as always, Michelle, for your brilliant suggestions. I wouldn't have even remotely thought of these last two vlogs without you. So I hope they've been useful. And I wish you, from beautiful Flinders University, love, light and peace. Tea out.